Hey everyone, I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today, and we're here at the HIMSS 2023 conference, and our special guests are Ed Cadet, he's CEO and founder at Sensinet, and also Eric Decker, he's vice president and chief information security officer at Intermountain Health. Welcome guys. Thanks John, thanks for having us. Yeah. Feels awesome like HIMSS is back, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, it's a crowded audience. I mean, we're freezing, but other than that, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little chilly here. Chicago's but... chilly. Yeah. Well, Ed, tell us about Sensinet's benchmarking study that you did with, with CLASS and AHA. Yeah, yeah, so we co-led the study with CLASS and uh, American Hospital Association, and it really came out of um, feedback from customers. Actually, Baptist Health out of Florida um, was going all in with NIST CSF, and we thought, wow, it would be great to add that to our platform give providers the ability to not only assess their third parties, but to assess their enterprise risk uh, on top of the NIST CSF framework. And then of course, because I do a lot of work with a four or five D <laughs> and Eric, uh, it just made natural sense to add that uh, in addition to the NIST CSF. So with those two things together, we began taking it on the road, talking to customers about how they would use it. And actually, Eric was the inspiration for adding organizational benchmark data to the, uh, yeah, to the actual platform which would enable organizations such as Intermountain Health and Baptist Florida and others to assess themselves and look at their results against the peers yep. within the industry and look at how much they were spending, how they were organized um, across their organization as it related to cyber, uh, for example, where medical devices were within the organization, et cetera. So that's how it all came together. Awesome. Eric, what is your perspective on these benchmarking studies? And tell us, what does it mean for your organization? Yeah, so it's you know it's really important to try to get a sense of are you over invested, are you under invested? How do you defend your program? How do you understand you know where you are in your journey and path to you know achieving some kind of uh, base resiliency you know that's out there? And I think one of the challenges that we've we've faced in this industry is we haven't had a really good way of understanding that actual benchmark and and where everybody is. Now we've all as an, as an industry, especially in the provider space, we've mostly uh, coalesced around the NIST cybersecurity framework. So that's good. You know, I think that's that's for sure the, the right framework to, to work off of, in my opinion. Uh, you know, but we're all sort of a little bit different in the way that you actually do that assessment. Some people could be doing it internally with by themselves uh, and sort of have that self-selection, self-assessment bias when you do that. You tend to make yourself look better than, than you are. <laughs> It's just a natural human sure, tendencies, you know? <laughs> and then there are some that, you know, organizations that will do validated assessments and all that. And, but the challenge with all of that is when you're, when you're trying to make a comparison between my organization and another organization and everybody's tool and rubric is different, even though the framework is the same, if the tool and rubric is different, it's not a really fair comparison. It's not apples to apples. You know, you're, you're, it's almost like a 20% plus or minus error ratio, which means 40% of the whole thing is, is wrong, you know. So the, 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 the beauty of, of the, the landscape, or sorry, the, the benchmarking study that Ed did is it's all consistent in how we went through the process and asked those questions. And there's like 800 questions or something like that. In yeah. it. I mean, it's exhaustive. I mean, yeah. it, is, it is a lot, you know, uh -huh. that goes into it. And you know, on a one to four Likert scale that shows you know what kind of coverage you have, and, and I think that's this is absolutely the right way to do it because it's cybersecurity is is all shades of where are you on your journey? You know, it's not like you made it, check the box, turn it on, you never have to worry about turning the lights off. Plus, you have again. an ability to update it too. Yeah, and you can trend it year over year annually, and it can really inform how you make decisions, what gaps you may have in your program, and where you want to invest in the next or during the next budget cycle as yeah. an example. Yeah, sure. well, I think that's one of the interesting things about Sensinet that even since you first started the company is one, how do we sh help organizations share, you know, across, you know, this, the benchmarks comparison, right? Or the work one's done to another, right? So it doesn't have to repeat. I, I, you know, that was one of the most fascinating things when I first met with you a few years ago. But you've been helping them with risk management for a long time. Talk about how this benchmarking study kind of correlates with all the other efforts you've done with risk management and being able to share that across organizations, Ed? Yeah, yeah, well, so when we started off building out the platform network, we connected initially providers with their third-party vendors and products. And today, we have over 35,000 vendors and products in the, in the wow. platform connected with, with providers that are trying to assess risk um, of, those, um, of those platforms that they use 
Um, and it could be anything from a cloud-based system to a medical device, or it could be a non-technical supplier that is critical to the business, like say a laundry service maybe, or a food service. So as we began working with customers, we began identifying these areas of risk that were silos, or you know, one area, cyber for technical, was managed by the CIO and the CISO, but the supply chain managed the non-technical suppliers, or maybe medical devices was managed by the biomed group. So being able to bring all this together under one pane of glass and have complete visibility and then take action on the data. So as we see risks come up, be able to understand what they are, how they affect us, and then take that next best action to remediate or mitigate that risk accordingly. So for us, it just became natural to start adding other areas of risk like enterprise level risk, which is really the base for the cybersecurity benchmarking study. Interesting. Eric, what would you add and you know, talk to us about how kind of sharing that burden with Sensinet and even other organizations is beneficial using their platform? Yeah, so I think, you know, first of all, it, it helps level set where we are in our journey, where our investments are. Uh, I think one of the things that's really important to know is healthcare has, generally speaking, across the board, I'm not speaking about Intermountain, but generally speaking as an industry, been underinvested in this space. And so, the, the, I think the thing that's like super interesting and what I'm really excited about, hopefully with the future of, of the benchmarking study as we go through more and more iterations of this, we get more and more hospital systems connected into it, is we'll be able to start seeing the trends of, does the investment lead to an outcome? And if the outcome is coverage of you know hiccup or coverage to the NIST cybersecurity framework, and that's a proxy to better resiliency and better protection, that's what we want to be able to see. Yeah. Now, of course, these are journeys. Like you get <laughs> investment day one, outcome could take three years. Sure. You know, and so when you do these studies, you might see one side of it where it's like, well, the investment looks really high, but the outcome doesn't. It's not there. So, oh, we're not doing a good job. Well, that's not necessarily true. You know, that's like right. you, yeah. you have to, yeah. you have to know where you are in the life cycle yeah, sure. of, of where things are. So you got to be careful not to not to lead with the data too yeah. much, but it really does help understand, like. In the grand scheme of things, where, where is it? You know, what, what, where do we sit? And it covers some really interesting correlations about the relationship for, of the work that, that's being done in certain areas of cyber. Like for example, medical devices, right? What, what some of the correlation we, we found is that for organizations where the CISO, where the, the security of medical devices is organizationally under the CISO, they actually have more coverage than if it's being managed somewhere else. So those interesting correlations really provide insight into how an organization can really structure for success and remove inefficiencies that may exist within the enterprise. Yep. Awesome. Well, one of the big news uh, leading into HIMSS really here is, is the HHS uh, 405D Hospital Cyber Resiliency Initiative Landscape Analysis. Is that a, you know, that sounds like a government term. Put, put that in like one long acronym. Yeah, I, mean, I think everyone's just calling it 405D, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right? It came out. Talk to us about the significance of it. Yeah, so so first of all, a little backstory. 405D is the joint partnership that, that exists between the industry and the federal government. It, it all sits within the cybersecurity working group of the Health Sector Coordinating Council. That's the, the thing that I chair. Uh, okay. I'm the chairman for that. I'm also the co-lead of the 405D task group. And the, the uh, original publication of 405D was the Health Industry Cybersecurity Practices, or HICOP, HNCP. Uh, so what we, what we just released yesterday was the update to HICOP, so HICOP 2023. And then right beside it was a also in, uh, equally as deep uh, and, uh, a study, which is a landscape analysis, which was studying the, hosp the US hospital systems and sort of how we are where our state of things are from a cyber resiliency perspective. So when you're looking, we're looking at this specifically around how are we getting beat? Uh, how are the adversaries beating us and causing disruptions to the point of, you know, potentially causing patient care or, or patient safety issues and, and that, that thing. It was not a study into what, how we're managing data security and privacy and confidentiality. You know, those are for sure risks that we have been managing for over almost two decades now. Uh, but really, really focused in on operations, continuity of operations, resiliency, and so forth. So that uh, that analysis actually leveraged the Sentinel uh, okay. AHA class study. Uh, it also leveraged another study from Chime, the Most Wired Survey. Uh, we conducted twenty. We had twenty conversations with hospitals uh, in the process to kind of vet like what we were seeing. 
We took an adversarial mindset, so we looked at FBI you know, reports, HC3 reports, CISA reports, uh, open source intelligence. How are they, what are the vectors that the attackers are getting in? And then we compared that to what the state of resiliency looks like. And so the result of all of that was essentially some findings that show certain areas that need urgent help <laughs> or urgent attention, sure. certain areas that we've actually made significant progress on, which is good, you know, like we want to be able to see, sure. see that progress happen. Um, and then some stuff as well that is important, but maybe not so right now. And so like that's going to turn into future forward thinking treatment plans, you know, like what are we going to do about all of this sure. you know, at this point? Treatment plans for cybersecurity. I know. I how like about that? that. that that's, that's, that's <laughs> we a good diagnosed touch. the problem with the landscape analysis. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. Now let's treat it. Nice. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> and what does that mean for Sensinet, Ed? I mean, how are you looking at this uh, 405D result? Yeah. So, so um, myself and others on my my team, we actually give back um, to industry by spending time mm -hmm. with the 405D, as well as the Health Sector Coordinating Council and the different different task groups and working groups. Um, so I work on supply chain risk management. I've done work with the model contract language for medical devices. Um, and there's a bunch of other things. Um, but I, I love the public-private partnership of folks coming together. It, it really is representative of that shared mission yeah. that we have that you can't, you don't really have in any other industry. Like everyone's a patient, everyone knows a patient. Right. And we all wanna do what's right for the industry and we all wanna protect patient safety. So for us, you know, it's it it's it's nice because it really not only supports our vision, but it also supports our mission, uh, and everything we do and, and how we think about you know building our products, working with our customers, and then giving back our time to industry. Yeah, it's interesting how in cybersecurity competition isn't a thing, right? Like we all want everyone to be safe right. and secure, and That's if right. they're vulnerable, that may make yeah. me vulnerable. You, so <laughs> you know, I could throw a little a little quote yeah. out. The, the previous uh, national cybersecurity director, Chris Inglis, before he left, he uh, was in charge of trying to coordinate the and the cohesiveness around all 16 critical infrastructure that exists. And one of the things he threw out there, one of the charges that he rallied, the rallying cry, was we need to set the system up in such a way that you have to beat all of us to beat one of us. That is such a cool rally. That's exactly what this should be. We should all be in this together as a coordinated defense against the people trying to cause harm. And we can't do this one at a time. We, one organization can't take on Russian speaking countries that have advanced persistent threats that come in and, you know, and, and try to take this stuff out. We've got to coordinate. We've got to share that information up and down between the federal government and us. We got to share that information, you know, across the sectors in real time and, and, and action, it's gotta be actionable. Yeah, you know, and remove the friction, yeah. remove the bureaucracy. Yeah. And because ultimately we wanna protect patient safety, we wanna protect patient care. And um, you know, these bad guys are relentless. They keep coming and coming, they're shutting down clinics, they're shutting down health systems, they're diverting care. I mean, if you're in that ambulance and that, your, your hospital gets hit with ransomware and now you gotta be diverted 40 miles out, yeah. that could be a problem. Yeah. So this is really personal yeah. when it comes down to it. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts, Eric, on kind of how you know people on the front line should be approaching cyber resiliency? You mentioned a few things. One is collaboration, another yeah. standards, you know, using the Sensinet platform to coordinate it across risk sure. areas. I mean, what are your thoughts? Like, what are your suggestions for someone who's like overwhelmed with their yeah. cybersecurity? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible, which is everybody who runs a critical uh, infrastructure, everybody who delivers care needs to be looking at hiccup the health industry cybersecurity practices. It's the, that document, it has, it's written for small, medium, and large. We've given you the playbook. We understand that there are small clinics, mom and pop clinics, or, or rural hospitals, community access, community hospitals, critical access hospitals, et cetera. They have very limited capabilities. There are things written specifically for them on how to get good resiliency and good hygiene into their shop. Stuff that doesn't even cost money, you know, as long as you, as, if you look at it. And we've distilled all the NIST you know, uh, advice and all the other signals that are out there and got to something that's you know, very specific. There's even other good impetus on doing this, which is if you implement pickup and you can demonstrate implementation of pickup for 12 months and you get hit, then OCR is required to consider your adoption of pickup pursuant to a new law, Public Law 116.321, in their enforcement action. What that means, like that's what the law says, what that means is if you've done this, you're very likely gonna get a pass. Right. 
you know, from, from enforcement. It's and like there's a get out of jail free card yeah. Yeah. to some extent. Well, I know you don't, don't want to be say careful. That. That's a, <laughs> not that. <laughs> but it's an incentive. It's a, it's and, a great incentive, and, and, actually. And there are more incentives coming. Yeah. There's more incentives we're working on, but it's all centered around hiccup. And so everyone yeah. knows the risk is you're going to probably get a hit. Yeah. But when you do, as long as you're doing the right things and you're, you're assessing risk and you've got controls in place and your people are trained, um, then why should you be fined? Yeah. You've already gotten a hit. You've already taken exactly. on the damage. And you don't need to reinvent this. That's right. Like it's here. It's yeah. here. That's so. beautiful. And I think that is what people are looking for because there are risks and they're going to, you know, we, we, we say now in security, it's not if, but when, when. you're going to be exactly. hacked. And so it's like, did you do the right things in place? So yes. that, that is a really yeah. incredible incentive. Well, thanks so much, Ed and Eric. I appreciate thanks, you taking John. time Thank to you. share about this. And thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcasting application. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.